about the market session, and how do we uh, go to uh, Professor Francesca Quinn? Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> Hello, good morning. Thank you so much. Thank you to the Council General. Thank you to Dr. Antonella Inchikitti for providing me with this opportunity to be here and moderate this very interesting uh, morning session of uh, the conference Science Interlocked with Gender Issues, STEM, Passion, Challenges and Gender Innovations. So today uh, we are here to talk about something, as I was saying, very fascinating. Uh, we, we are going to explore uh, the vital role uh, that women have played and continue to play in the scientific research and innovation. And we have, we are fortunate to have our three uh, incredible and distinguished speakers uh, this morning, Francesca D'Alessandro Baer, uh, Annalisa Quaini, and uh, Londa Schinger that she will uh, join us uh, over Zoom later on. So, it is my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Francesca D'Alessandro Bear. So, her, um, her lecture title is uh, Becoming Visible, Stories of Women in Science. She's going to explore uh, an exemplary case study text written by a female physician during the Middle Ages, then transitioning to the Renaissance and eventually proceeding toward the modern age. In this presentation, she will show the accomplishments, but also the challenges of women engaged in scientific research. Among other things, Dr. Baer will provide some examples of how some, sometimes gender stereotype, discrimination, and silence has shaped not only the construction of women's career, but also the place of their intellectual achievement in history. Now, biography about uh, this distinguished speaker. Uh, Francesca Bera is a native of Italy, is a professor of Italian and classical studies at the University of Houston in Texas, where she teaches courses in Italian, Latin, and literature and language. Her research is oriented on both fields. Her book on Lucan, Feeling History, Lucan Stoicism and the Aesthetics of Passion, appeared in 2007. Then a monograph, Arms and the Woman, Classical Tradition and Women Writers in Venetian Renaissance, has come out in 2018. Dr. Bear's interests cover ethic, classical uh, reception, Renaissance studies, gender studies, and translation studies. A lot of stuff. <laughs> Between, uh, wait, wait, oh, I didn't know. <laughs> Between, uh, there's more here. <laughs> to 2015 and 2020, she has been member of the committees, Houston, and she is currently a board member of Texas Scientific Italian Community. Lastly, uh, in 2014, Giorgio Napolitano, at the time president of the Republic of Italy, has bestowed upon her the honor of knighthood of the Order Stella d'Italia for her committed service to promote Italian culture and language abroad. Now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Francesco. Thank you to everybody for being here. Thank you to Dr. Guevi for this wonderful presentation and obviously to all of uh, those who have made this uh, wonderful event possible. Uh, as, as you know, as, as a historian, as a classicist, obviously, my role here today is to be begin a little bit with history, like Dr. Gwery suggested, but then eventually I will be eager to arrive to the present time, which are probably a little bit happier. Uh, my presentation, as you can see, is called Becoming Visible. And the first slide, uh, simply I wanted to introduce the topic through this statue. This is uh, Margarita Hacker, you know, famous astrophysicist. And I have been told, I wasn't aware of this, that uh, there are very few statues in Italian public soil that feature um, women of science. So in 23 there was a competition and ultimately a sculptor, an Italian uh, female sculptor uh, nicknamed Sissi, 
modern and, and so they created this beautiful I, I wish I'd given you the entire body because you know you see Margarita Hackner of course is looking at the stars and you know the bottom if you look at the feet of the stars which are not represented a picture like a galaxy she's emerging from a galaxy as, as almost a, you know, a lady uh, of, of, of the stars but again you know, I hope women will become more and more visible. I will start uh, with a famous uh, physician known as Tota. Acting in Salerno around uh, the middle of the century, in the port city of Salerno, already by the study of medical books coming from the Greek and Arab world, were being translated into Latin and were being studied in the advanced, if not yet institutional setting, of the Salernitan School of Medicine. Only in 1231 it would become formally a university thanks to Frederick II. Trata was probably part of this setting, although we do not know how she became literate or by whom she was trained. She wrote a book titled Practical Medicine, whose manuscript has emerged only recently uh, in Madrid. Again, only recently she has been associated with the Trophia, the most famous assembly of materials on women's medicine dating from the late 12th century. With the name Trophia, today we designate a group of three medical Latin texts. This is of women, treatments for women, and ornaments of women dealing with gynecology, infertility, infant care, and cosmetics that originated in 12th century Salerno. Monica Green, the modern scholar who has contributed the most toward a proper understanding of the history of the text, believes that the Salernitan Trota is quite probably the authority behind treatments of women, one of the three books of the Trotula collection. Although the gender of the writer is not discernible through the Latin linguistic medium of the book, attentive analysis of the voice and content of treatments of women reveals that without any doubt, it records a woman's voice, or better, a female's eye and hand. Somebody who speaks to an audience of women and from the phrasing used displays direct knowledge of and access to women's bodies. The book, quite loosely organized, clearly contains specialized knowledge. For instance, its female author, against the common current conceptions, attributes infertility to women, to women and men. She believes that people should eat a balanced diet, exercise regularly, and take good care of their cleanliness. She gives tips for improving well-being through saunas and massages. Mm -hmm. Considering that we are in the Middle Ages, these ideas are simply extraordinary. However, a careful analysis of the text also reveals that Trotha's focus is eminently empirical, that she does not cite written texts and rarely refers to theory. She never comments on what the cure she recommends does to the physiology of the body. Her writing style suggests that the book addresses midwives or probably other women who will perform what she advises rather than an audience of peers. Don't undermine theory in favor of practice and is not interested or not able of framing her medical discourse within the current available medical tradition and the methods of medical discourse already developing around Salerno. By the 12th century, medicine was already becoming a body of knowledge tied to theoretical principle, written text, and authors which serious physicians had to master and address. This was a medicine that no oral discourse could sustain. Why does Trotta neglect theory? Is it because she's writing for a lay audience? Or is it because she's unable to have access to the books her male colleagues can access? We cannot definitely answer to these questions. All we know is that the Trotula collection became part of an anonymous tradition 
of women's medicine, presided over by men, who incorporated in it in their books without any acknowledgement of the women's specific imports and names. Tarta's excellent empirical expertise is transmitted without her name and ultimately considered insufficient. Tarta is never cited as an authority, and although known as a physician, she remains at the boundary of literate medicine. Already by the 12th century, women's lack of literacy and access to books and dialogue with peers marginalized them in the medical field. The marginalization of women in the science, real and constructed, continues in the Renaissance. Um, until recently, women were seen as having played absolutely no part in the scientific revolution of the 16th and 17th century. Textbooks narrate the transformation in the field as inaugurated and brought to completion by men alone. Over the past decade, decades, however, research investigating the actual practice of science in this period has revealed the ways in which women were involved in the production of scientific knowledge. Historians of science have shown that women of the early modern period in a private setting read books, conducted research, and theorized about the nature of humankind and of the world. In discussing Turkey, I have highlighted women's interest in the body of women. In the Renaissance, their focus widens to include gender and the physiology of the mind. Women reflect on their nature as they defend themselves from the accusation of inferiority drawn by men. Renaissance philosopher Lucrezia Marinella takes ownership of scientific discourse, using it to demonstrate women's merit. Marinella was the daughter of a physician who fostered her education at home. An exploration of her ideas demonstrates how the literary culture that accompanied the new science, as well as the established traditions of natural philosophy, drove the early modern Corel de Femme. The Corel de Femme, or woman question, refers to a debate about the nature and status of women that gathered momentum during the 16th century and in which Marinella participated with her treatise, you see it in the slide, Nobility and Excellence of Women, a text written principally to refute that of a colleague, that, that of a man, Giuseppe Passi, the defects of women, you know, issued in 1599, which used biological and religious arguments to undermine women's value and intelligence. Passi considered women inferior, in need of men's control. He ridiculed educated women, repeating Pericles' famous dictum in Thucydides history that silence is woman's best ornament. Marinella argues against Passi by using the authority of a man, Aristotle's authority. She claims that Aristotle was right to conclude that women are usually, if not always, cooler than men, temperate rather than cold. She links this cooler physical state to their capacity to execute more proficiently the soul's operations, reasoning that those who are physically temperate are also psychologically and morally temperate. We can see how cleverly Marinella uses Aristotle conclusions about women's temperature. Instead of employing it to declare their inferiority, according to Aristotle, it was women's cooler temperature that made them unable to concoct semen, you know, that obviously was what men, you know, the top of the you know, species were able to do. But in this case, the lower temperature is employed, you know, to justify their superiority. Marinella defends women, realizing that ancient sources did not agree about their worth. In a modern fashion, she cites her sources precisely and begins from them to build new arguments. She also notices that women were regarded in different ways in different countries. While Aristotle blamed them, Plato praised them. In her treatise, she defends women's education. 
In underlining the problem of access to learning, she argues that women should be given the same tools of education that are given to men. She writes that men, fearing to lose their authority and become women servants, often forbid them even to learn to read and write, and clarifies that learning is inclusive of literature, but also of the sciences. It may be easy to dismiss these discussions as antiquated because based on unscientific conceptions. Instead, they reveal how Mariella articulates at least three extremely modern claims. First, an historicist approach to the evaluations of facts, that is, all knowledge and cognition are historically conditioned. Two, the importance of equal access to education. Three, the necessity of framing gender in terms of biology as well as environment. In other words, gender as a cultural construction rather than a biological fact. With her book, Marinella fought to renegotiate gender boundaries within the limits imposed by men and their scientific academies in order to secure for women a place in the history of Western civilization. Another extraordinary, extraordinary woman to my consonants I want to remember today is the physicist Laura Bassi. Uh, Laura Bassi was active in the 1700s. Bassi occupies a special place in the history of women, science, and the university because she was uh, not only a brilliant physicist, but also the first woman to obtain a salary position as university professor at the you know, University of Bologna. And as you know, in this position, she was actually able to teach two men. Bassi's case is exemplary because, again, she, she ultimately could have a research but also a teaching career. But as it will become clear, she had to fight to be a teacher in academia, an activity her male colleagues received by default. By adopting a clear-headed strategy based on determination, authority achieved through her scientific abilities and on a good network, she overcame the limits that the Bologna authorities had imposed on her teaching on account of her being a woman. The first biographies of Bassi focus on her Catholic and motherly identity, reassuring the readers that she excelled in the domestic arts. They stress the oddity of a woman endowed with such a brilliant intelligence. Women and brain are still viewed as a rare, even paradoxical combination. Only 10 years earlier in Bologna, the College of Jurisprudence had refused to confer a law degree on Maria Vittoria de Fimbrosi on the basis that a woman doctor was a contradiction in terms. The first biographer of Bassi also emphasizes her alleged reluctance to lecture and her modesty. And she emphasizes her modesty. Modesty, like the production of children, was required for women. It offered reassurance that their knowledge would not be used to demand a higher role in society. Modesty was a guarantee that a cultured woman was still a woman who would remain in her place. Bassi's biographies document an 18th century Italy preoccupied with minimizing and controlling women and change. Women's greater access to culture indeed posed a risk to gender hierarchies and the distribution of power in the family and in the order of society. So biographers reassured the public that although Bassi was a physicist, uh, she was also a housewife. Uh, in this milieu, authorities cannot help but conferring Bassi a degree, but hinder her appearance you know, in, you know, in, in, in a public classroom. Beyond fears and stereotypes, only recent historians have finally revealed the real Bassi using all the documents available, like, for example, the correspondent that at the beginning of the 1900s, her family 
donated to the RPG Nazio. This new research has emphasized not simply Bassi's main contribution to the development of Newtonian physics at a time when physics was still divided between the views of Descartes and those of Newton. The scholarship draws light on her desire to contribute to teaching and her long struggle to overcome the limitations that Bologna, the Bologna Senate placed on her didactic activities. <coughs> In fact, in 1732, after having defended a thesis, published her dissertation, she had asked for a, lect a lectureship, which was denied to her. The Senate stipulated that Bassi could not help the regular classes a lecture only to the general public and on special occasions. That is why she began to teach privately in her home. This home activity often undermined, allowed her to have contact with students to choose the themes she most preferred, electricity was one of them, and to illustrate them with experiments she was implementing in dialogue with a rich network of male scientists visible in the correspondence we have obtained. Of course, her own instruction and academic meetings with my colleagues were considered uh, a scandalous activity and caused continuous gossiping. That is why in 1738 she actually decided to marry to mostly stop the, the gossiping. Only in 1776, thanks to her reputation, she was finally granted a chair in experimental physics you know, in Bologna, thus becoming the first woman appointed for chair of physics at any university in the world. It was a fitting high point for her career, but sadly she did not live long to enjoy the position because two years later you know, she died in some weight. We jump now to the end of the 1800s. While Einstein in Switzerland was a few years away from publishing his Agnes Mirabilis paper, in Italy, Maria Montessori was studying medicine. She became interested in psychiatry when attending a psychiatric clinic to collect the data for her thesis that eventually she published in 1896. The choice of getting her degree in Clinical psychiatry was considered odd for women normally pursuing gynecology or pediatrics. Montessori instead was fascinating, was fascinated by the human mind. Once in contact with the children of the clinic, approached their condition with a new scientific perspective, which produced path-breaking results. For observation, Montessori noticed that often mentally disabled children Crave stimulation, recognizing your patient's need for stimulation, purposeful activity, freedom, and self esteem, she dismissed the caretakers who treated them with scorn. And facing a desperate lack of staff, she set out to teach the less disturbed children to take care of themselves and other children. She found the medical libraries of Europe seeking successful work linked to the education of children with disabilities. Her studies led her to almost forgotten physicians, like the French Jean-Marc Guitard, who in the 18th century studied the deaf mood. Montessori realized something revolutionary for the time, that, develop, that developmental delays associated with retardation could be not only a function of mental deficits, but also a result of the environment. And the fourth mental deficiency was a problem that required a special kind of education and not all in other treatment. This attitude challenged the boundaries of established disciplines and fundamental medical assumptions, but also sociological frames which marginalized children perceived as simply unable to learn. Montessori, the physician, had turned herself into an educator and a social reformer. Uh, disabled children uh, from around Italy were brought to live and learn under her new theories and methods, uh, you know, the methods she was employing, and established that giving children choices, freedom, and time to observe and interact with the environment, an environment carefully prepared for them, 
they would learn. By the end of their instruction, many of them could successfully pass regular state examination you know, that the rest of the children were also taking. With such dramatic results, she began to wonder if she could apply similar methods more broadly. If the benefits accruing to differently able children exposed to approach could indeed benefit all children. Indeed, if her new education methods could be the means, or in general, to cultivating more efficaciously all children's development. And indeed, her intuition proved correct. When Montessori created the Casa di Bambini, the children's home, in San Lorenzo, at the time a very poor and problematic home and neighborhood, and applied her methods there, the results were simply exceptional. She turned children deemed difficult and at risk into model students. Her holistic approach, she was a pioneer in the use of the word ecology, is quite visible when we read the texts, texts where in the narration of her experiments, she does not employ an impersonal and technical register, but borrows the language of economy, politics, religion, social denunciation to widen the horizon of the imports of her scientific enterprises, making them epistemologically relevant, relevant to all humanity. In addition, she championed the rights of women, the banking historical and contemporary theories which assume women's inferiority still. She challenged leading social scientists who, while claiming to be scientific, use traditional stereotypes to assert women's biological and sociological subordination. She challenged Jean Michelet, the historian, who argued that women uh, were cons constitutionally weaker than men and required constant tutelage, making their emancipation pointless. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, the social theorist, who claimed women had only the choice of being housewives or prostitutes. Cesare Lombroso, the anthropologist, who, while creating you know, the basis of the study of modern uh, criminal anthropology, also described women as incomplete organisms in a state of arrested development. And finally, Giuseppe Sergi, another important anthropologist who contended that women's social equality would undermine the family and destabilize society. Montessori's life is witness to the international reputation a woman could obtain during the 1900s. However, I would like to end these brief remarks in the present, <coughs> reminding you of you know, the brilliant career of another internationally recognized woman. This, of course, particle physicist Fabiola Gianotti, current director of CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research in Switzerland. Her second term began in 2021, and you know, this is the first time CERN's history has a director general that is a woman reappointed for her second term. Donati loves music, ballet, and ancient languages. She initially decided to study philosophy because it formulated, as she says, big questions, but eventually changed to the study of physics because it was more likely to produce answers. <laughs> she, she joined CERN in 1994 and later led experimentation connected to Atlas, uh, the vast underground cathedral of detectors that monitors the explosive debris thrown out when beams of protons traveling at near light speed are made to collide inside the large Hadron Collider. As head of Atlas, Ternotti oversaw 3,000 scientists from 177 universities and 38 different countries. The Atlas and Compact Moon Solenoid experiments searched for the Higgs, the elusive subatomic particle that gives mass to the basic building blocks of nature. This work in 2012 bore fruit when the particle 
that Peter Higgs had predicted in 1964 was indeed finally found. The Higgs boson explains how all other fundamental particles get the mass, and it is the last piece in physicist's standard model, a mathematical theory that explicates the relationship of the known particles to each other. Many hope that the Large Hadron Collider, which was perfectly designed to find the Higgs, will also provide answers to questions pertaining dark matter, whose gravity appears to hold galaxies together, but whose constituent parts remain a puzzle. Janot is the first woman to lead what is perhaps the greatest particle physics research center in the world. The odds were stacked against her in the European scientific community for every woman at work, there are two men. In the Atlas team, only 20% of scientists were female. And as one of the Nokia colleagues at CERN explains, they're often harshly treated. And I quote from him, a particle physics is a very hard environment. He says, if a man makes a mistake, it is a mistake. If a woman makes a mistake, she gets massacred. And of course, Donatia Weber denies suffering and discrimination. As she points out, she was democratically elected to her position. She does not believe there is intellectual discrimination against women in science. But this does not mean conditions, especially for female scientists, are perfect. As a matter of fact, she affirms that not enough support is provided for women when they are having children, and as a result, they do get uh, you know, practically marginalized. When asked to highlight benefits provided by CERN to the world, she mentions advancement in technology. The World Wide Web, for instance, first created to facilitate exchange of data among physicists at CERN and you know, uh, institutions, has now changed every person's life for the best. But above all, about CERN, Gianotti says, and again I quote, is a concrete example of worldwide international cooperation and a concrete example of peace, a place which makes us better scientists, but also better people, and end quote. On the sixth edition of the Giornata della Scienza Italiana del Mondo, Using Janotti's words, I conclude my remarks wishing not only that more women pursue scientific investigation, but also that thanks to the continuous efforts of the international political community and the spiral challenges, the field can be open to all individuals wishing to be better scientists, but above all, better people. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for let us understand. I think the the, the great contribution that actually women brought to science, especially I was very struck by when when you were speaking about uh, Montessori mm -hmm. and because her being a woman uh, brought me from the perspective of being a woman brought like a a specific contribution to research, right? So it's really, it was really illuminating. Thank you. Now we can um, open the uh, floor to questions, and so we have ten minutes for question and answers. So, so we are feel free time. to yes, we have ten minutes, right? <laughs> yeah, so feel free to ask any question to Dr. Bear. It's just amazing to me that Matsi was 65 years old before she got her chair. Yeah. So, and that's just, yeah. I mean, even then, I mean, that's way beyond retirement age. I mean, it's, that's just Right, and, and you see, Bassi, obviously, I, I, you know, even my audience of uh, scientists and physicists, uh, of course, I do not want to approach her on the technicalities of the technical fields, which, which you know, is not strictly of my confidence, but I, I became very intrigued when I learned about this uh, impossibility to teach it, because obviously as part of our research, you know, we are eager to research, but we are also, I think, very eager to share what we learn uh, with, uh, you know, the entire, you know, uh, research community and with 
the world. So the idea that you know simply because she was a woman, she could not be exposed to a classroom made up uh, of, of you know mostly uh, male students uh, was, was was to me in fact I, I I don't think I'd ever thought about it, but uh, a shock. And and again, I I loved how cleverly she was able to. I push it and pushing, but I mean, she said, "Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll do it in my house." Even for that, in fact, she had to ask permission. And uh, if my sources are correct, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, in part, she was helped by the the Pope. You know, the Pope at the time, that was Benedict the Fourteenth, uh, was you know like a fan. You know, he was in awe with her, the kind of research that she was carrying around and, and so she facilitated her own teaching but she had to ask for permission even for that and Jerry as, as you mentioned yes I mean ultimately she she's a sign that through determination we can accomplish uh, our goals uh, but but it took it took uh, it took a while yes on this point that's very true all, all the women Despite today, are accomplished obviously, mm -hmm. and they eventually say that there's only partial discrimination of things like that. I strongly disagree with this because, uh, yes, it's true that through determination you can get what you want. Most big strong sponsors, and these examples are all, all of people that actually had strong sponsors. Oh. Is it the same for men? Do you always need that? strong sponsors or to ask permission to the right yeah. people in order to achieve those high positions. I don't think so. Right. And and I mean I I, I think we completely agree. Uh, you know, sure. this, <laughs> I, I try to select uh, you know examples of women that you know we, we have documentation about uh, about them. So this is a sign that ultimately they were successful, right? Yet when you start reading about their history a little bit more in detail, you realize, like you say, that uh, I mean, Lucrezia Marinella obviously had an enlightened father who, from the beginning, did not prevent her from reading and studying. And you know, he was a physician, so uh, she had access to books. I mean, obviously, they were you know fairly wealthy, so they could buy books. And, and she became educated, you know, in the uh, you know library of, of her own father. Now, again, I I I agree with you that ultimately it took some kind of sponsorship, perhaps first that of the family sometimes, but then also that of some male colleagues that were differently minded, you know, because even Marinella, as you know. Uh, an editor who helps her to publish uh, her, her book, right? And we saw even even Bassi, uh, although you know the, the University of Bologna tried to hinder her work, ultimately through her connection was able to be successful. And there are beautiful, beautiful letters of uh, scientists, physicians who write wonderful things about her. Like she became a part of an academy. It was only 25 people, you know, chosen the Benedictini. Uh, and she was the only woman. And amazingly, she made it. Uh, again, probably the Pope had, had something in connection to that. But, uh, you know, in this, uh, let's call it, committee of 25 distinguished people, men, uh, she was not granted uh, voting. Right. So it's interesting because, you know, yes, society to, to a degree hinders. Uh, and and uh, we, we got, I, I do think that's why history is important. You know, great improvements have occurred, I believe. And so that's why I, I'm an optimist by nature. I, I don't like to think that. Uh, as as you know, we women the victims. I, I, I don't wanna I don't wanna in, 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 especially in the century in which we live. 
nevertheless, you know, uh, it takes uh, a trained eye and commitment to make sure we create an environment that, you know, again, creates opportunities in, in, a, in, in a, you know, to, to, to everyone, you know, all genders, all categories of, of people. So, thank you very much for coming <laughs> Yes. So now I have just another question. Oh, oh, sure. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for your very interesting talk. The explanation of the discovery of X boson was fantastic. <laughs> and uh, uh, just uh, at first glance, do you can, can you summarize three qualities that a new generation could learn from this very important figure? Uh, I I come here. I you know what, what would you like? Three qualities. Three, three qualities. qualities. Three qualities that all these women uh, yeah. seem to, uh, I would say, a great commitment. I mean, work, work. Nothing can be uh, accomplished without uh, working hard, you know. Uh, I, I think uh, it is absolutely necessary. Also, you know, uh, new perspective. It, it seems to me that. Uh, these women, perhaps in part because they are not uh, traditionally trained, uh, seem ultimately to uh, have a different perspective. I mean, I love, it, for instance, of Montessori, that she starts uh, as a physician, but you know, in that field, she seems to have you know a different kind of, of eye, and and immediately she applies this. You know, perhaps observation, and maybe the quality number two is being observant. You know, uh, look at your environment. I think the interaction between ourselves and the environment is is critical. You know, for us as human beings, but also for us as uh, researchers. And uh, quality number three. Uh, I don't know what we what, what, what should we say um, grit. Grit. <laughs> courage. Yeah. Grit. Grit. Yes. I mean, courage. Uh, you know, uh, I don't wanna I don't wanna put it in negative terms. Yeah. But um, uh, we we as women, I think, uh, are called to wear, as they say in a, you know in an English language, wear many hats. And, uh, and uh, we are called to do many things at once. And, and it's easy to become, I don't know if I should say, distracted or to lose focus. Uh, and, and so if we don't preserve that, that strength, that grit, you know, it may, it may become impossible to uh, pursue our goals. Thank you very much. No, I also wanted to say that uh, our lecture that all these women and other women, of course, uh, in history, were able to um, to have sponsors, to have supported because they were valuable, right? right? And they were uh, they were they brought an amazing contribution. And this brings me to another woman that we have here, uh, Professor Annalisa Paimi. Um, and so I'm gonna read the uh, title of her uh, lecture. In the meanwhile, yes, <laughs> learning the language of the universe. Very cool <laughs> title. The mathematics of clouds, crowds, and nanoparticles. Uh, mathematics and mathematical modeling allow us to explore and understand complex systems from natural phenomena to human behavior. By using mathematical equations to describe the system, we can predict their behavior under different conditions and test hypotheses in a way that would be impossible through experimentation alone. In this talk, Professor Quaini will provide some real-world examples of mathematical modeling, explain the basis of computational stimulations, and discuss how they contribute to our understanding of the world. Her biography, Annalisa Quaini is a professor of mathematics at the University of Houston, 
all University of Houston is here. <laughs> she earned her bachelor degree and master degree in aerospace engineering at the Politecnico di Milano, Italy, in 2005, and received a PhD in applied mathematics from Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland in 2009. Her interests are in general area of computational partial dif differential equations, <laughs> and more specifically in computational fluid dynamics and fluid structure, interaction with various applications in medicine, biomedical engineering, and atmospheric science. She is a recipient of the 2021-2022 William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and Fellowship from Harvard Radcliffe Institute. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Thank you for the generous introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today, and I want to thank everyone that has made this uh, day possible. So before I get started, do we really have half an hour? <laughs> or are we late on the schedule? No, no. So yes, yes, no, half an hour. Half an hour. Okay, yeah. good. Okay, perfect. So I chose a rather <laughs> grandiose title for my presentation, right? Learning the language of the universe. So let me start with the quotation this is referring to, which is from the book Isagiatore that Galileo published in 1623. The universe is written in the language of mathematics, and its, its characters are triangles, circles, and other geometrical figures, without which it is humanly impossible to understand a single word of it. So Galileo is saying that without mathematics, we cannot understand the universe. And he goes on saying that without math, one is wandering around in a dark labyrinth. So today, in this presentation, I want to show you a little bit of my work on the mathematics of clouds, crowds, and nanoparticles with the intent of turning on the light in the labyrinth. Why clouds, crowds, and nanoparticles? What do they have in common? Nothing but the fact that I work on them. <laughs> on these projects. And let me be clear, though, that this is not my work alone. I, all of my work is collaborative. And this, this was the group of uh, collaborators at the beginning of my cloud project, which is my most recent. And although it's maybe a little too dominated by Italian men. <laughs> I was still happy with its diversity. In fact, at that point, we were an Italian, Tunisian, American, Chinese workforce uh, with expertise in different disciplines. And I also added my younger child here because <laughs> I started this project during my fellowship year, uh, and I was pregnant. And uh, she participated to a lot of meetings after uh, I delivered. So rightfully, she belongs to the uh, to the group of collaborators. Uh, although this is my most recent project, the project on clouds, diversity is not something that has been important to me only recently. It has been always important. In fact, this is the picture of me with my first three PhD students, Dewa, Kritika, and Kayla. Uh, this, is the, this was the day of Kritika's graduation in 2019. I had been working uh, with them since 2016. Uh, and uh, the reason why I wanted to show you this picture is because it looks very different from my PhD advisor's lab in 2007. <laughs> I circled in red the only woman in the group. Not only I was the only woman for the entire duration of my PhD, I was the first woman to earn a PhD with this professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne, and he had been there for 10 years. The PhD is in applied mathematics. Women make up 50% of the undergraduate population in mathematics, so it's not that there were no candidates. Diversity was just not a priority. And I wish I could tell you that the other groups in mathematics look different. Sadly, they all look like this. In this picture, bears a resemblance with a famous picture taken at the Soviet Conference on Physics in 1927. 
This is a famous picture because it portrays pretty much all the greatest physicists of the 20th century. In fact, you may recognize here Albert Einstein, mm -hmm. but you can see Bohr, Schrodinger, Heisenberg, Pauli. I mean, all the big names in physics in the 20th century. And I circled the right the only woman. <laughs> so, you see how in 80 years, the picture hasn't changed much. In less than a decade, I was trying to introduce a drastic change. Lengthy introduction that serves the purpose of connecting my presentation to, the, to today's topic of gender interlocking with science. Let me get to the mathematics of clouds. I started to work on this project out of anxiety related to climate change. And as I was learning about it, I came across geoengineering. Geoengineering, or climate engineering, is the deliberate and large-scale intervention in the Earth's climate system with the aim of alleviating the adverse effects of global warming. It is, as you can imagine, sometimes seen as controversial because global warming has anthropogenic causes, so how is it that man's intervention is going to solve this problem that we cause? However, uh, there is substantial agreement among scientists that geoengineering strategies could delay the catastrophic climate destabilization that climate scientists warn us would result from inaction. So basically, with geoengineering strategies, we could buy us time to implement drastic cuts in greenhouse gas emissions and to deploy clean energy globally. Now, according to the U.S. National Academies of Sciences and the British Royal Society, one promising geoengineering strategy is called marine cloud brightening. The idea of marine cloud brightening is to seed clouds with aerosol particles that roll within the cloud so that the cloud becomes brighter. And by being brighter, it would reflect more sunlight. So when clouds become brighter and they reflect more sunlight, the temperature on the ground remains cooler. This is something that can already be observed, for example, in shipping lanes. They can see here. So this is a satellite image over the Pacific, where you see that the clouds are brighter in the shipping lanes. And there, the aerosol particle that seeds the cloud is just pollution from the ships. Now, as you can imagine, there are a lot of details that have to be figured out before marine cloud branding can actually be used in practice. One of the details, for example, is the seed size, because the seed for the cloud has to have the right size for the increased brightness to occur. If the seed is larger than that, you have increased precipitation and the breaking of the cloud deck. If the seed is smaller than that, then you have increased evaporation, and again, the clouds disappear. I know it sounds like science fiction. <laughs> it is not. It's, there is a consortium of universities and national labs that are supported by the DOE to understand how this can become a reality. They've already invested billions, so this is not too far in the future. All right, so of course, one of the uh, things that we have to figure out in the process is, will this actually hold its promise? Or will it have unintended consequences? And by this I mean that if we are riding the clouds off of the coast of California, are we causing droughts in Pakistan? Um, the way we can figure that out is through global climate models and computational simulations. So as Galileo was saying, right, uh, we need mathematics to understand the universe, so you see in this cartoon how scientists use the, the word, right? Equations everywhere. That these equations were studied over the centuries and they describe a, a great variety of um, phys uh, physical processes. The equations that are relevant to the atmosphere in this cartoon are written here in the river. They are called Navier-Stokes equations, 
from the two scientists that uh, worked on them first. In fact, they were developed from 1822 with the work of Navier, a French mechanical engineer, to 1850 when they were finalized by Stokes, who was an Irish uh, mathematician and physicist. So if they are the equations of the atmosphere, why are they in the river here? Because the Navier-Stokes equations describe the motion of viscous fluids. The air in the atmosphere and the water in the river are two viscous fluids. They just have different viscosity, so they obey the same, the same laws. Okay, so let me show you the equations that describe the dynamics of the atmosphere with humidity. So you have down here equations that are, uh, that are related to the Navier-Stokes equations, and they describe air with no humidity. Then we have two equations up here in the clouds. One is for vapor, and one is for suspended water. So water droplets that are not big enough to precipitate, and so they remain suspended. And then we have an equation for precipitating water. This is a complex problem. Uh, you can see that, for example, variable u which is the wind velocity, appears in all of them, so it's a couple problem. And although it is complex, complex, it's actually a simplification, because we don't have ice, so we don't have water in its solid uh, form. If we had ice, we would have a third equation up here for suspended ice, and then at least two for precipitating ice in the form of hail and snow. So it would be even more complicated, but we're in Houston, we don't care about <laughs> Ice. <laughs> All right, we have the equations that describe the problem. What do we do with them? Now, in school, you learn how to solve equations like x plus 6 equal to 10, right? Where you can easily find the exact solution. So you know that x has to be equal to 4. <laughs> so you take 4, you plug it into x, and that gives you 10 equal to 10. Which is true, you found the exact solution. Now, forget about doing that with a problem like that. Like, there is no way that you're going to write down u equals to something. No. So, what you do instead is to use a branch of mathematics, which is called numerical analysis, to find an approximation of the solution. So, you cannot write down the exact solution, but you can get close to it with certain algorithms. Numerical analysis has seen a lot of developments in recent years because computers are becoming more powerful and so on, but it's far from being a recent discipline. In fact, one of the first examples of numerical analysis is on this Babylonian tablet, so a tablet from the 18th, uh, 1800 to 1600 BC. And what it reports is an approximation of the square root of 2 which is the diagonal of the square of side 1. So the square root of 2 is a number that needs an, an infinity of numbers. On this Babylonian tablet, we have a sexagesimal approximation for it. So you just have the first so many digits. It is an approximation of a number that needs an infinity of digits. All right, so now let's take the algorithms that we get from numerical analysis and apply them to this problem here to simulate a storm. So here we go. So if this is a simulated storm, down here you have the time. So the clouds are forming. And then at some point you will see that rain starts falling. Here you see that the rain starts falling. The storm is still developing and you have more and more precipitation. At some point, when water is precipitating, you have that the clouds start to dissipate and the sun comes back. And we are two hours into the storm. This is all simulated. This is not real. It looks real because it's based on mathematics. So with simulations, we can get 
pictures, I mean, sequence of pictures like I just showed you, but you can also get some quantitative data about a storm. For example, here I reported a picture, you see the cloud, but you also see the amount of rain that is falling at a certain time. So we can, from a simulation, we can learn uh, how much rain will fall in a certain region over a certain period of time. And in this particular simulation here, the cloud that you see is at a cumulonimbus incus. So this is a cloud that grows all the way up to the stratospheric stability when it stops growing and then it develops this flat top that is like an anvil. And it's the kind of clouds that it's a it's a storm in its mature stage. You can sometimes see them when you're flying. I took this picture when I was flying. Uh, I, I don't remember later. But you will always see them from a distance, right? Because the last thing that you want to do is to fly right into a storm. Okay, this is great, right? We have the equations, we can simulate the we can simulate atmospheric processes, we can extract quantitative data about it. What I still haven't told you is the computational cost that the simulation has. This storm here in this picture is over a, an 84 by 84 kilometer domain, so roughly from here to Galveston. Two hours of storm take about a week to simulate using 40 CPUs, so 40 computers that are interconnected and talking to each other to find an approximation of the solution to this problem. So we are far, so to find out what happens in those two hours, you have to run your simulation for a week. So the computational cost of the simulation is very intense. If you want them to be accurate, which you want, right? Because you want to know if tomorrow is going to rain. <laughs> Imagine how much a simulation like this would cost. So this is a global weather simulation. And it refers to end of October, early November 2012. Why are we simulating the past? We want to run a simulation from the past just so that we can compare the results with, for example, satellite data and check that our simulations are in correct. So let me play this beautiful simulation here. So a global weather simulation, you see some interesting features like the urinal cycle, sorry, here is the date and here is the time, cycle of convection over Central Africa and over the Amazons. You see the formation of cyclones in the Indian Ocean and over the Pacific. So you see the cyclones that form, gain intensity, and then eventually dissipate. And then Another interesting feature is here the formation of these photographic clouds downstream of the Rockies. This is not a simulation that I ran. It's sourced from the National Center of Atmospheric Research. I found details about its resolution, which is 4 kilometers. This is pretty much state of the art for global uh, weather simulations. I could not find its computational time. But if a two-hour storm took, four, took a, uh, a week on, on, on 40 CPUs, you can only imagine how long this was taken since it's over two weeks in the, on the entire world, right? So if I had to guess, I would say that these are thousands of CPUs, so thousands of computers that are talking to each other and for about, probably for over a month or so. So extremely expensive. Now, if we want to simulate climate, we have to take this and run it for a century. Mm -hmm. So this is very challenging. So uh, which gets me to wrap up this part of my talk. What are the challenges if we want to simulate, to study the effective, effectiveness of uh, geoengineering strategies like marine cloud driving? Well, the, the prohibitive computational cost. There is a lot of research in computational mathematics, which is what I do, and computer science needs to be done 
to reduce the computational time of this kind of simulation. Then the, another challenge is the multi-scale nature of the problem. Remember that we put, we put a seed, so an aerosol particle in a cloud, which is part of the global circulation. So you go from the microscop microscopic scale to the mesoscopic scale to the macroscopic scale. So scales that are talking to each other. And finally, we have the multi physics nature of the problem when we have convection, clouds, radiation, which I've talked about radiation from the sun, and so on. So a lot of research that has to go into making these climate models of computationally affordable. So let me just conclude by saying that you know, I said that I started this project because I have climate change and climate change, which I do. But also because I am obsessed with clouds. These are some of my pictures of clouds. I have hundreds of them, so I know it's kind of like problematic. But some of these are taken in Italy. For example, this is Mount Etna, and this is Lipari, I think, seen from Salina. So I was happy to, start to work on this because it's a, a, something that I've always been fascinated with. All right. Now, as usual, I think I talk too much about clouds. <laughs> but let me get to crowds. I probably will not have time to talk about nanoparticles, but if you're interested in this, just shoot me an email. Okay, so let's get, let's get to crowds. Why do we care about modeling and simulating crowds? Because simulations of crowd dynamics, and I put it in red, with the spread of a disease or an emotion, like fear, can help address questions related to public safety. Let me start with a question related to public safety that we're all too familiar with at this point. Thanks to COVID. <laughs> Case of a spreading disease. Should we change the way we operate airports and schools? For example, places that usually have see large crowds of people. And if we should change them to reduce the spreading of a disease, how should we change them? How can we minimize the spreading. Well, you can test different scenarios with simulations and find out what is one of the best ones. And then, so then if we're talking about the spreading of a disease, but let's say we're talking about the spreading of an emotion like fear, because there is a propagating fire in a venue or a gunshot in a venue. Can we design safer venues using simulations of crowd dynamics? Now, I don't have, obviously, a video for spreading disease, but I do <laughs> have a video for the spreading of panic. Right. So these are security cameras from a square in Torino, the day that they were showing a soccer game. Uh, what happened here is that somebody tried to rob a person in this corner of the square, and they tried to do it with pepper spray. Oh. That generated a wave of spreading panic, they led to a stampede, they led to one person dying in the crowd and several injured. So keep your eyes on here and you will see the propagating wave of panic here. Okay, this is just to show you that with simulation of crowd dynamics, trying to simulate what would happen in that situation ahead of time would help us better manage safety. There are different models for crowd dynamics that are related to the scale of observation. So we have microscopic models where basically you follow each person. So they are also called individual based models. And you follow them with the simplest law that you have in physics, Newton's second law of motion. Mass times acceleration is equal to force. We're not talking about a, a, an actual force that is pushing this pedestrian or pulling it somewhere. The forces that we have to design so that we obtain realistic crowd motion. So what are these forces? We, we can imagine that this pedestrian is pulled towards a goal, which could be an exit. 
and it's being repelled by other pedestrians or obstacles in the room because they don't want to bump into other people or into the obstacles. These microscopic models have enjoyed a lot of success. They're pretty good at uh, uh, having realistic simulation of crowds, and they were developed mostly by computer science. Uh, they do become computationally expensive when you have a large number of people. Because you're following each one of these people, right? So the more you have, the more expensive this will be. Okay, fine. So what do you do if your crowd looks like this? Right? They fail get the sub filming in Spain or the soccer game in Italy, right? Well, you stop following each one of them. When you look at the crowd as a continuum. So if it was a fluid, a thinking fluid, then this new type of models is called microscopic. So you look at the crowd as a continuum, and it's only valid when that assumption makes sense, so when you have a high-density crowd. The crowd is described in terms of macroscale variables, so density, rho, here, and velocity, u. Let me get to the last type of model here, the mesoscopic models. So this is in between the microscopic and the macroscopic. So you have a crowd that is large still, because otherwise you would be using the individual grade models, but not enough to justify the continuum uh, hypothesis that you have for macroscopic models. So that's why I put this picture here. It's kind of a large crowd, but you still see that there are holes here from which continuum assumption would really not fall. These models describe the crowd in terms of a probability distribution function f here. f tells you the probability of finding at time t, at position x, a person with walking velocity u. All right, okay, fine. What can we do with this, we were saying? Well, we ran a small test in Hobby Airport with a microscopic model. We introduced a small number of sick people, one of two, in a medium-sized population, about a few hundred, at the airport at, uh, at a given time. And believe it or not, I started doing this before COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried that people who didn't get vaccinated with measles. You know, I so, like, let's think about measles. It became a useful later on. So, what do we want to do? Well, we want to find out the average number of infected people. So we divide the population into immune, a percentage of the total, because it was measles, because I had measles. And then they're going to be green in the simulation. Susceptible, that are black. Infectious, that are red. And it's going to be just one or two, right? And exposed. Now, the exposed people, can get infected and they will, they will turn blue or not, and they will uh, they will become orange with a given probability. So to get exposed, you have to be within a certain radius of the sick person for a certain amount of time, and if that happens, you have a certain probability of getting infected. Now let me show you a simple simulation. This is only a hundred. Let me pause it because I get it gets dizzy. <laughs> this is only a hundred people in hobby. Right? So how we, you, you know, they go through security here. There are the restaurants here. Let me move this like that. There are the restaurants here, the restrooms, and then the gates, right? So here you have some people that are complaining and people that are coming in through security. And they will randomly either go to the restroom or go to the restaurant or go to the wait areas at the gates. This is the geometry of a hobby. I just reduced the number of gates as it was getting. <laughs> so only a hundred people, you see that these are just green and black, so immune or susceptible. And now there is one sick person that is coming in through security here. And this is faster, right, than people walk, which is so that we don't spend too long right here. And now the sick person goes to the bathroom. We spend quite some time there to get one person infected. Okay. Now, we do this for 200 times, just to simulate, you know, to see what happens when the conditions change. And 
we can learn out to other situation is in average how many people get infected when the percentage of immunity varies from 90% down to 55% of the population. And we did this with a crowd of 400 people, the blue lines here, one sick person, two sick people, and a crowd of 1,000 people in the airport, one sick person, two sick people. So you see that if the percentage of um, immunity is 90%, maybe one, pers one person of less than that will get infected. If it goes down to 50%, of the population that is immune, then the number of infected people is drastically increasing. I think I should stop here, because I've talked enough. So, too bad for the nanoparticles. <laughs> <laughs> Let me conclude. So I started with Galileo, I'm going to finish with Neil deGrasse Tyson, because why not? <laughs> Math is the language of the universe, as Galileo said. So the more equations you know, the more you can converse with the cosmos. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Fraini. It was really stimulating. We need to, uh, one thing that I wanted to say that really struck me about your presentation is the fact that before uh, the Dr. Uh, Intikiti asked about what qualities do we need in order to succeed, you know? And I think you show this very well. No? The first thing that you need is passion, because you are like, uh, your passion is really infectious. Right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so, thank you very much. We need to, uh, we have our third speaker yeah, no, I don't, I don't on Zoom, so can we please keep in mind the questions yes. for Professor Quaini and uh, keep it there and we will ask the question that we have later, okay? And I'm gonna go the podium to present to present the can you hear me? Yes, now I can. Great. Hello. It's a pleasure Hi. to have you. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I, I'm now uh, going ahead and introduce you. Um, as I was saying, uh, uh, Dr. Professor Londa Schivinger uh, will present uh, a lecture uh, with the title Gender Innovations Enhancing Excellence in Science and Technology. How can we harness the creative, creative power of sex, gender, and intersectional analysis for discovery and innovation? This talk will explore health and biomedicine, AI, ML, gendering social robots, and embedded ethics, climate, and more. Professor Schivinger will look at how sex and sex interact, how sex and gender interact at intersectional research. Um, she will also discuss uh, policy initiatives at founding agencies, peer-reviewed journals, such as Nature and Universities and Research Institutes. To match the global research well, of science well. and technology, gender innovation was developed through a collaboration of 220 experts from across the United States, Europe, Canada and Asia. Major founders include the European Commission, the U.S. National Science Hello? Foundation, and the Stanford University. Professor Londa Schibner is Professor of History of Science at Stanford University and founding director of Gender Innovations and Science, Health and Medicine, Engineering and Environment. Gender innovations employ the creative power of sex gender and intersectional analysis to enhance excellence in science. Dr. Schivinger is leading international expert in gender, on gender and science and technology and has addressed the United Nations, the European Parliament, the Korean National Assembly and numerous founding agencies on this topic. Professor Schivinger received her PhD from Harvard University, and she is elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the recipient of numerous prizes and awards, including prestigious Alexander von Humboldt Research Prize and Guggenheim Fellowship. 
She's also honorary doctorate from Universitat de Valencia in Spain, 2018, Lund's Universitat in Sweden in 2017, and Vre Universitat in Brussels, Belgium in 2013. Among her numerous publications, she, uh, we, you can see AI can be sexist and racist. It's time to make it fair on nature 2018. Sex and gender analysis improves science and engineering on nature 2019. Gender innovation too, how inclusive analysis contribute to research and innovation, European Commission 2020. A framework for sex, gender and diversity analysis in research funded agency have ample room to improve their policies on science 2022. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor London Schiebinger. Thank you for being here. Yes, thank you. Um, it looks like you've been having a wonderful day. So, um, so today we will explore gendered innovations. Gendered Innovations was produced through a large international collaboration involving the European Union, uh, the national, the U.S. National Science Foundation, and Stanford University. We've now expanded into South Korea, South Africa, Argentina, and Japan. And in Japan, an Institute for Gendered Innovations was founded in April of last year. Gendered Innovations, um, as, as was said, brought, has brought together over 220 basic scientists and gender experts in a series of collaborative workshops and new policies have been implemented across the European Union, though maybe not in Italy, so maybe we can discuss this, what your funding agencies are doing, uh, and in Canada and the US. And we have also expanded into Silicon Valley for industry leaders, such as Apple, Google, and the like. So innovation is about integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis uh, into the design of research. The operative question is, how can we harness the creative power of sex, gender, and intersectional analysis for discovery? Does this approach add valuable dimensions to research? Does it take research in new directions? Now, a bit of background. Governments and universities across the US and Western Europe have taken three strategic approaches to gender equality over the past several decades. So the first approach is what I like to call fix the numbers. And it focuses on increasing the number of women and underrepresented groups in science and engineering. This is about participation. It's about creating gender balanced research teams. It's about hiring more women at universities. The second I call fix the institutions which promotes gender equality in careers through structural change in research organization. This is about reforming universities and research institutions so that everyone's careers can flourish. It's about parental leave, about work-life balance. And the third one I call Fix the Knowledge or Gendered Innovations stimulates excellence in science and technology by integrating sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into research. And here the European Commission is a leader, along now with many national funding agencies, including, for example, the German Research Foundation, the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Now, in my short talk today, I will focus on this third strategic approach, fixing the knowledge. It's the newest area and the most important for the future of science, innovation, and human knowledge. And this is what gendered innovations is all about. Now, we distinguish, I hope this isn't, my little picture isn't in the way. We distinguish these three fixes analytically, but in reality, they work together. Although many people try to fix the numbers first, we will not fix the numbers unless we fix the knowledge. And here, let me give you two quick examples of the link between who does science and what science is created. 
So the first is one of our studies. Using a sample of 1.5 million medical papers, our study found a link between women's authorship, so women researchers, and the likelihood of a study including sex and gender analysis. These findings show then the mutual benefit of promoting both scientific advancement of women and the integration of sex and gender analysis into medical research. A second paper, which I like very much, is by Rem Koenig at Harvard Business School. And we know that women file only 13% of the patents in the US. So Rem Koenig has shown that if all biomedical patents filed between 1976 and 2010 had been produced equally by men and women, there would be 600, uh, 6,500, 6,500 more female focused biomedical inventions leading to biotechnologies that would benefit women. So I'm on the board of a femtech right now, and it's extremely interesting. Now, why might all of this be relevant to your research? Maybe you collaborate with European researchers. Beginning in 2020, the European Commission's Horizon Europe strengthened their gender dimension in research. Applicants are now required to integrate sex, gender, and or intersectional analysis into the design of research or to justify that it's not relevant. So if you're doing theoretical physics, uh, studying black holes, it's not going to be relevant. But for the vast majority of research, it is relevant. To support this policy, the EC held a two-year expert group, which I directed. The group consisted of 25 uh, experts from numerous fields of science, from biomedicine, marine science, machine learning, and environmental sciences. And our results are published here. The book is easy to find and download. It's completely free. And most, uh, many of the materials are also loaded to the Gendered Innovations website, which you can use. Or maybe you collaborate with scholars in the US. In 2016, the US National Institutes of Health implemented its requirement that sex as a biological variable be included in all publicly funded research. The idea is, and this is important, the idea is that if taxpayer money is being used, the research should benefit everyone across the whole of society. Now, until now, the NIH has considered gender too complex to implement in biomedical research. But NIH, National Institutes of Health here in the US, held a conference in October, which I attended, where we were devising strategies for implementing gender as a sociocultural variable. Over 1,000 people attended this virtual me meeting and I should say that the discussion of gender quickly opened up other social factors um, that we will discuss under intersectionality a bit later. Okay, now let's, we're all set to dive in. Uh, let's dive into sex and gender analysis in research. Doing research wrong costs lives and money. For example, 10 drugs were recently drawn from the US market because of life-threatening health effects and eight of those posed greater threats for women. Not only did these drugs cost billions of dollars to develop, but when they fail, they cause human death and suffering. We cannot afford to get the research wrong. Or take the case of osteoporosis. This is osteoporosis is the disease that thins the bones as people age. Because osteoporosis was considered primarily a women's disease, Diagnoses and treatments for men have lagged. Yet, after a certain age of about 75, men account for nearly a third of osteoporosis-related hip fractures. And tragically, when men break their hips, they tend to die, and we don't know why. So analyzing the intersection, the interaction between sex and gender in osteoporosis research has developed new diagnoses for men and the search for better treatments is underway. So doing research right can save lives and money. And this is what Gendered Innovations is all about. 
this project develops state-of-the-art methods of sex, gender, and I should say intersectional analysis, and provides case studies to illustrate how gender analysis leads to discovery and innovation. And in this talk, I will discuss some of these case studies with you. Now, one of the most important things you can do as a researcher is use the terms sex and gender correctly. So, uh, so sex, of course, refers to biological characteristics and genders to sociocultural attitudes and behaviors. Sadly, researchers often confuse these terms and use them incorrectly, which makes meta-analysis difficult. So you can read all about it in this particular article. And importantly, sex and gender interact. Sex and gender are distinguished for analytical purposes, but in reality, they mutually shape one another to form individual bodies, cognitive abilities, and disease patterns. So Vera Ragetze Grosek in Germany has offered this very nice image. Um, so to show that sex and gender interact across the life course. So she is thinking of sex as genes and sex hormones. These interact with society. She's a cardiologist, so she is talking about nutrition and lifestyle, but this could be gender or education, um, any uh, behaviors, social behaviors, norms, attitudes that interact with sex over the course of the lifetime to make us who we are as adults. A lot of us think of sex and gender in binary terms as male, female, man, woman. And gender is moving quickly beyond just men and women, as I'm sure you're aware. A 2000, uh, 2022 Pew Report survey found that 1.6% of US adults are transgender or non-binary. And among young adults under 30, this is much higher at 5%. Now you'll remember that in 2014, Facebook famously released 58 gender options for user signup. Of course, at the back end, they recoded all of this into the binary two categories for advertising purposes. But nonetheless, um, it, it's an important acknowledgement that there are many flavors, we might say, of gender. Now, we also know that some 15 countries allow a third sex category on legal documents, birth certificates, passports, and the like. Some of these countries are Germany and India, and in the U.S., at least 18 states allow, allow this, including California. So the goal of gendered innovations is um, to add value to research by ensuring excellence in science and to add value to society by making research more responsive to social needs and to add value to business by developing new ideas patents and technologies. So let me move, just zoom through some of our case studies. As I said, doing research wrong costs lives and money. Research fails and fails more often for women. Um, so let's take a look at some of these examples. Take search engines, Google search. Um, in Google search, let's say you're searching for a job. In the search results that appear, men are five times more likely than women to be out offered jobs for high paying, at, sorry, to be offered ads for high paying executive jobs. So why is this? It has to do with the data and the search algorithms. Men in the US, the data is one big issue. Men in the US on average are paid 20% more than women. This is an average of all men and all women not broken down by any other factors. So the algorithm has been designed to get the ad to the right person. And in this case, an ad for a high paying job would go to a man. And as you can see, this perpetuates the cycle of social inequalities. However, once the engineers become aware of such problems, they can fix it. Here's another example from computer vision. So um, as you know, so computer vision, here we see 
a photo of a traditional uh, U.S. bride dressed in white, and she is correctly labeled bride, dress, woman, wedding. But a photograph of a North Indian bride is mislabeled as performance art, red, costume. So why is that? So here is ImageNet. So ImageNet um, is a neural network of image classifications uh, that matches the labels to the images. And I'm sure you just all use it and may not know you're using it, but in fact, you probably are. So the reason that though that the North Indian bride was labeled incorrectly is because 45% of the images in ImageNet come from the US, even though we represent only 4% of the world's population. If you take India and China, those countries represent 36% of the world's population, but only 3% of the images in the database. So therefore we're, we're getting these errors. Now, another example is in health technology. We have a lot of examples here. So soap dispensers don't work for people with darker skin. There is a video that went viral and I don't really have time to show you, but there are two guys in a, in a men's room, one with lighter skin hands and one with darker skin hands. So the guy with lighter skin puts his hand under the soap dispenser and a voila, he gets soap. The guy with the darker skin puts his hand under and nothing happens. Lighter skin, soap. Darker skin, no soap. So why is that? Because the near infrared technology to see the hand, close the circuit and dispense the soap doesn't work for darker skin. It was probably developed by people with lighter skin. So more seriously, as we learned in the pandemic, pulse oximeters don't work for people with darker skin, and this can put them at serious risk uh, for conditions like heart disease. So another example here, um, mechanical engineering. I'm taking one from each different field, from many different fields. So in automotive crashes, belt-restrained women are 47 times more likely than belt-restrained men to be injured in a car accident after controlling for weight and body mass. Now, we all know that this is because crash test dummies take the medium-sized male body as the norm, leaving others at risk. Now, each of these examples is important, but what did you notice about them? Each example focuses on only one social dimension in isolation, either sex for the automobile crashes or gender in the Google searches or skin tone in the soap dispenser. And here we need to focus on a higher level problem, intersectionality. So what is intersectionality or an intersectional approach? Intersectionality describes overlapping or intersecting forms of discrimination related to gender, sex, ethnicity, age, socioeconomic status, sexuality, um, geographic location, uh, disabilities. It can be any of these things. The term was coined in 1989 by legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to describe how multiple forms of discrimination intersect specifically in Black women's lives. In 1989, her concern was that the white feminist movement was excluding women of color. And now let me show you how now intersectionality has expanded to many social factors beyond um, just race. So let me show you how intersectionality works in research done on facial recognition by Joy Bulamwini, and this research is called Gender Shades. So <clears throat> what Joy, I should say what Joy Bulimwini discovered when she was a, a PhD student at MIT, she's now a, a doctor, a PhD. Um, she works in the field of facial recognition and she discovered that the very program she was developing could not see her. It could not see a black woman's face. So she put on a white mask and then the program could see her. Black mask could not see her. 
So um, she and her colleague, Timnit Gebru, did this study called Gender Shades. Um, and here we see gender shade studies, intersectionality, specifically how sex and race interact. Uh, so here the gender analysis showed that systems perform better on men's faces overall than on women's faces. Then you add to that the race analysis. This shows that the system performed better on lighter skin overall than darker skin. And then you get to the intersectional analysis and this is quite remarkable. We see that the system performed worse for black women. The error rate was 35% for darker skinned women, got better for darker skinned men at 12%, better at 7% for lighter skinned women, and less than 1%, it's almost perfect for lighter skinned men. So, but there's more than just race and sex. We see sexuality can be an issue as well. Systems cannot recognize transgender faces often, especially during periods of transition. And then there's another gender analysis we can do. Facial cosmetics reduce the accuracy of facial recognition methods up to 76%. Good to know. So if you're getting on to one of those 15 hour flights, <laughs> you should make sure that the makeup you're gonna where when you get off is the same as your passport photo, because of course, facial recognition is used more and more at international borders. So now here is the intersectional innovation. Bulamwini and Gebru wanted to solve the problem and they created a more inclusive data set that includes the faces from men and women with lighter and darker skin and they drew these faces from members of parliament from six countries, three in Africa and three in Europe. Uh, so they're public people and they can show their faces without a problem. But what problem do you see still in this data set? Is it really a global solution? So my students saw immediately that there are no Asians, East or South Asian, that there are no indigenous people from the Americas or from Australia. And we don't know if any non-binary people are imaged. So we still need innovations to make sure technologies work for everyone, but this is a real step forward. Um, of course, we love facial recognition because it opens our phones and computers um, and that sort of thing. But let me add, um, getting the data right and making technology see everyone is one aspect of the problem with facial recognition. There are larger issues of security that I'm sure you know about. Transgender people, for example, may not want to be tracked by facial recognition systems at all. And the potential misuse of facial recognition has led to several actions. Belgium, for example, has declared the use of facial recognition illegal. France and Sweden have banned it in schools, and the city of Fran San Francisco has banned it uh, for public authorities. So for intersectionality, we here at Gendered Innovations created a new tool. These are our intersectional design cards, and I'm pleased to say they won a prize in the UK last spring. And these may be helpful to you as you start a research project. You can see our list of intersectional factors. We chose these 12. There are many, many more. Um, and this really helps designers learn how to design for everyone. So you can experience the cards on our website. They're completely free, but they work better in person if you're working in in-person teams because you throw them out on the table and you work through the examples. We sell them at cost, um, so they're, they're freely available, they're available. Now here is Apple's intersectional list of factors, and it's huge, <laughs> it's a lot. I'm, I, we didn't go for political beliefs and philosophical beliefs and religion, but those can be important things. One I like here is handedness. Um, we my, So Stanford faculty all live on campus in faculty housing. So all of my neighbors are professors and my 
Next door neighbor is a hand surgeon and she's left-handed. So handedness is an issue. In the When she learned surgery, there were no surgical tools for left-handed people. So she had to learn everything right-handed. She's extremely famous and a real specialist. Think how awesome she could be if the tools had been made to match her needs. So there are a lot of things here that are very interesting. Now, I wanna make two points here. First of all, the factors, these factors differ by cultures. Um, both of these sets of factors that you've seen were developed in a US context. Europeans, for example, tell us they can't include race. Well, you know, there's still racism in Europe, so maybe include race or skin tone or something. Um, and because we all design for a global culture, we may still need to consider factors that are not super relevant in our culture, but might be for our global market. Now, the second point to make is that each research, that we shouldn't get freaked out seeing so many factors. Each researcher needs to choose the factors most relevant to their research, to their product. You can't look at all the factors as in any research project, you start big and then you narrow it down. So um, you should start by considering all the factors so that you don't rely on an unconscious default as you are developing your research. Now let's move on to a couple other examples. Um, and I'm going to take assistive robots. The robots surely are coming. Um, and there are a lot of questions about what social characteristics robots, assistive robots, should embody, if any. For example, should robots be gendered? If a robot is a nursing robot, should it be gendered female to match user expectation? We have to remember that 90% of the nurses globally are women. And if a robot meets user expectation, will the patient be more compliant? Will the patient be more likely to take the medicines or do the exercises that the robot is recommending? Now, it's important to remember that robots are designed in a world alive with gender norms, gender identities, and gender relations. And here I want to talk about the gender norms. These are the pressures that are pressing in on individuals to make your behavior conform to certain beliefs about ideal behavior for men, women, non-binary, transgender, for people, for different genders. So we know that there are these pressures are in the workplace. We have norms in family culture. Your parents expected you to act a certain way. Your parents may have expected you to take up a certain line of work. So anyway, these are all the spoken and unspoken cultural attitudes and, and that influence our behavior. And humans, whether as the designers designing the robots or users using the robot, tend to gender machines. We gender our machines because in human culture, gender remains a primary social category. Now, many specialists in human-robot interaction argue that this human tendency to project human social cues, including gender, onto artificial intelligence may help the users engage more effectively with the robots. But there is a danger here. As soon as users gender a robot, stereotypes follow. And the danger is that gendering robots may reinforce gender inequalities by embodying current stereotypes. So designing hardware, i.e. robots toward current stereotypes may amplify or perpetuate these stereotypes into the future. So the challenge for designers is to understand how gender becomes embodied in robots and to design robots that promote social equality. So let's take Pepper. Uh, Pepper is, uh, how would you gender this robot? Pepper is made by SoftBank in Japan and is used globally. 
So um, I think they've taken it off the market now, but it's still very well known. So how would you gender this little <laughs> robot over here? So we look at the name first, Pepper. Pepper is nicely non-gendered. So SoftBank on the website calls the robot a he, but the name itself is fairly gender neutral, at least for us in the US. Um, and as we have to remember, all, all robots are produced for a global market. But I find, but let's look at anatomy. I find Pepper's anatomy confusing. With the absence of hair, it looks sort of boyish, but with this cinched, very narrow waist and skirt-like legs, it seems kind of feminine. Although I can think of many instances in Japanese culture where men do wear skirts, you know, samurai, that sort of thing. Now the voice. Okay, voices are full of cultural in information. The pitch of a voice indicates whether it is male or female. And the voice they've chosen for Pepper is childish because a childish voice is perceived as non-threatening. So there is one big innovation around voices. And if I may, I hope this will work. Um, I would like to play for you the new genderless voice. Okay, I have to stop sharing and then I will share again. I want to play for you this new genderless voice uh, that came to us from Denmark and here you go. Thank you. The world's first genderless voice assistant. Think of me like Siri or Alexa, but neither male nor female. I'm created for a future where we are no longer defined by gender but rather how we define ourselves. My voice was recorded by people who neither identify as male nor female, and then altered to sound gender neutral, putting my voice between 145 and 175 hertz, a range defined by audio researchers. But for me to become a third option for voice assistants, I need your help. Share my voice with Apple, Amazon, Google, and Microsoft. And together we can ensure that technology recognizes us all. Okay. Thanks for listening. Yeah. So now I want to, let's see, I want to share my screen again. So I hope this is, you can see it fine. Somebody let me know if you can't see it fine. Anyway, so that's a huge innovation. We know that um, all of these virtual assistants, there's been a lot of criticism of the virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa and those because they all used a female voice, very stereotypic female assistant, right? That's what women do in societies. So Q is just a really lovely innovation, um, which is a genderless voice. Um, so now what about the color? Social critics point out that most of these robots are white. Okay, they're plastic to be sure, and many of them have blue eyes, which is problematic from an ethnic point of view. Remember that these robots are being used internationally. You know, how many Japanese have blue eyes anyway? Um, so it'd be easy to choose a color not in the human color palette. Now, interestingly, uh, we find uh, we found one robot that can be customized for skin tone and gender. So this is Carver. Carver is a darker skinned, he's, this one over here is a darker skinned robot designed for learners with autism spectrum disorder. And Milo is the lighter skinned robot with the same function. So you can choose which would be most uh, effective with your students. Now I used to criticize Robokind, the company that makes these robots because they only had these boy-like robots, but Wait for it. Here are Veda and Jimmy. Jimmy. So we have a lighter skinned and a darker skinned girl type robots. This is important because even though autism affects boys four times more than it does girls, we need a teaching robot for the millions of girls suffering from the disorder. Now, I don't know if these are non-binary or transgender robots, but anyway, I think this is a real step forward. So again, the challenge to roboticists is to understand how gender is embodied in robots. And here you see 
this is how you think about it. We're trying to create a virtuous circle, not a vicious circle, but a virtuous circle. So culture is alive with gender norms, as I showed you. Engineers have the opportunity to challenge these gender norms in their designs. They can work against user expectations in ways that might, in fact, change user expectations by embodying technologies that promote gender equality, then the users um, have the opportunity to rethink these gender norms, and this should eventually change our culture. Now, I have a few things I still want to do, and I have a little bit of time. So I want to uh, turn now to climate change. And my example, we have examples from all areas of science. You can ask about that in the Q&A. Um, this example uh, is from marine science, and I currently have an Italian Marie Curie postdoc, um, Elena Ghisi, here with me here at Stanford, at Stanford's Marine Station, and we're just publishing a review of sex analysis in marine organisms. So um, the interesting thing about marine organisms is that these are their numerous, many, many sex types. Of course, they have male and female, but then they have simultaneous hermaphrodites, sequential hermaphrodites, so on and so forth. Marine organisms are so much more interesting than we boring humans, I would think. Um, so as a, oh, as a note here, I want to say that in marine science, we still use the term hermaphrodite. In For humans, of course, we use the term intersex. And I have not heard why we have not changed our term for marine organisms, but it doesn't really matter. Now, in looking at this, we also pro uh, produced a decision tree. So these are the kinds of methods that we have in the Gendered Innovations website. What you want to do when you're thinking about marine organisms is sex binary. Are the, well, no. So are the sexes distinct? Or yes, is sex fixed? So we step through a, a decision tree. So global war warming is hurting marine organisms. And this is of concern for us all today. And importantly, whether we're talking about fish or mollusks or crustaceans or other marine organisms, they respond to global warming and their response varies by sex. This is something that is not known and that is important to know if we want to manage ecosystems. So here's a really nice article by uh, Rob Ellis and he looks to see what he shows here is that only 4% um, of the studies in marine science, this was 2017, have analyzed sex. They talk about marine organisms, but not uh, disaggregated by sex. So this is a missed opportunity. Now, why is this important? For species, for example, reliant on temperature, for sex determination, such as turtles. You learned this in grade school. Um, so some organisms become male or female depending on the temperature when they're incubating. So for species reliant on temperature for sex determination, rapid global warming poses a risk to sex ratios and the stability of populations. So as you know, the sex of turtle depends on the temperature. If the climate is warmer, you get a female. If the climate is cooler, you get a male. An important study found that turtle sex ratios respond dramatically to global warming. In Australia, uh, the turtles born in the warmer north, so in the warmer part of the Great Barrier Reef, for instance, were 99% female. This is unsustainable while in the cooler sites, they remained more of a natural 68% female. So such a change in sex balance can lead to population collapse. So analyzing sex-based responses in climate change enables better modeling of demographic change among sea or organisms and downstream impacts on humans. Effective machine, uh, ocean management and mitigation of climate change impacts depend on understanding organisms and the ecosystem responses to anthropomorphic and environmental change. So designing sex, gender, and intersectional analysis into research 
is one crucial component contributing to world-class science and technology. And now I want to go to our website for, I think I have five minutes remaining. So just for a short moment, let's see if I can get this up here, yes. Um, you can use our website, it's free. Two million people across 185 countries have used it. Um, here we have all of our methods. Uh, you might wanna look at analyzing gender. One point we make here is it's not just one thing you do, it goes through the entire research process from identifying the problem to designing the research, collecting the data. And then we have some, this was all updated in 2020. We have some of the latest research here on how you approach each of these components. And then we have all of our case studies. An important new one is the computer science curriculum. What's happening in the US, and I hope uh, in some of the Texas universities, is that, um, that social analysis, what this group calls ethics, but we could call it responsible computing, that social analysis be integrated into the technical courses so that students graduate with a computer science major understanding the social implications of their work so that we don't run into Google search uh, giving high paying ads to men and maybe not to women. So this is a new case study just done in last August um, and very important. Um, we have a lot of case studies in health and medicine. I didn't go over heart disease and diverse populations. Chronic pain is a very interesting one. Engineering, we have many, um, here's the gendering social robots that I talked about, but haptic technology is really important too. Robots are not only going to assist you, they're going to eventually touch you. And the question is, what kind of touch how, what are the social rules for humans touching each other and how will this apply to machines? And then of course we have our environmental uh, case studies, very important. So I wanted to show you a little bit um, from our policy section. So policy is so important. And uh, we, Gendered Innovations did a study of 22 publicly funded agencies across six continents. So a global study. Uh, we did not study any of the Italian agencies um, because we could only choose so many European agencies. But if your major funding agencies do not ask for sex and gender and intersectional analysis in proposals, then Italy is missing a huge chance uh, to do research right, to make it excellent, to make it work for everyone across the whole of society. So globally, uh, we boiled down the things that make a policy successful. And you can click into each of these five pillars and see, okay, I wanna do, uh, well, I want definitions of terms. So you don't have to make your own definitions of terms. You can go to some of the greats and get those definitions of terms so that you can just get started. Um, so we do that uh, for policy. We also have collected the um, policies of peer-reviewed journals. You know that Nature, Cell, um, all the Elsevier journals, which are lots and lots of journals, have all now, Lancet, the Lancet, <coughs> now all have policies asking for excellence in manuscripts. And that includes having sex analysis where that's relevant, gender analysis where that's relevant, intersectional analysis where that's relevant. And then for the curriculum, universities really need to, um, universities are kind of what hold everything together and we need to integrate these type of analyses into our teaching. So medical schools, should do all the sex, gender, and intersectional stuff so that we don't need lectures like mine anymore, that all graduates from professional schools, from universities will understand this information. So um, I just want to, to say thank you for your attention and I'm very happy to answer questions.
Thank you so much, Dr. Schivinger. So we can, uh, and also for teaching us uh, that diversity, uh, I was very struck by your presentation, diversity is a resource. And so thank you for making this uh, the subject of your, of your research, creating innovations. So please, uh, let's open the floor for uh, questions. And if you can please come here to ask the question so Dr. Schillinger can see you, so you can communicate face to face with her. Please. Yes, we have a question. Hello, Professor Schillinger. Uh, you uh, mentioned at the beginning of your presentation the three fixes and then focused on the third. However, the three are obviously linked to each other, as you yourself said in the presentation, because you said, you know, if the researchers are women, right, they're more likely to include uh, sex and gender into their uh, research. And also the example on autism that you had uh, brought this Hello? to my mind, because I reviewed a, a proposal for an institute about how autism is considered to be more prevalent in, in boys, However, that led to uh, girls not being diagnosed for autism. And so maybe it takes a different kind of research to be uh, inclusive of everyone that is actually affected by autism. So uh, this is to say, does your research focus also on the other two fixes or it's predominantly on the third that you discussed today? Okay, so let me start with a remark on the first point that you made that, that I said that our study found mm -hmm. that women do sex and gender analysis mm -hmm. more often. That is not how it should be. Sex and gender Absolutely. analysis is, a, these are variables that create excellence in science and everyone should be doing it. So we just found historically women did it more and <laughs> that's great because we are the pioneers, but nonetheless, everybody should be doing it. Um, so <clears throat> I have been doing research. My first book was published in 1989. So I've been doing research for many, many years. I have focused on all of these aspects. Mm -hmm. um, my first book was really on the 18th century and the emergence of modern science and the modern system that came to exclude women from science, because if you don't understand the mechanisms of exclusion, you cannot open the doors back up. So I have worked on all of these uh, for, so the Gendered Innovations website opened in 2011. For a while, we had a whole section on number two, the institutional mm -hmm. fixes, um, but I wasn't keeping that up to date. And so we closed it. It's still is lurking there behind closed doors, but we closed it. And um, <clears throat> there, there have been, so both the European Commission and the US National Science Foundation really focused on fixing the institutions in, a, in around 2000. So the US uh, NSF had the advanced program. Yes, These were yes. very large pro, uh, pots of money given to universities when the president signed on, everybody signed on. And they did really systematic change to make sure institutions were working for everyone. And I would say the 2000s, we were working on institutions to make them good for women. And now uh, we're working like Stanford is working very hard to make institutions comfortable for ethnic minorities, especially right now. So, and they, and sometimes I think they've forgotten the gender aspect, but <laughs> there we need an intersectional approach. And then the European Commission did a large report on, uh, I just saw it in my files uh, the other day, on structural change. And so there are many resources out there um, and many programs that work, but we, we, it's so much to focus on the research in all and many, many fields of science that we are just doing that. It's huge. Yep. Yep. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hey, can you hear me? 
Yes, I can. Amazing talk. Thank you very much. Just a real curiosity. Uh, I was fascinated about the, the gender neutrality of robots. Is there any discussion in the community about using robots to break gender stereotypes? Yeah, so that really is the focus of my work when I deal with this. So there's a whole group of roboticists who want to keep robots in robot space. So don't anthropomorphize them at all. Um, but we're thinking about how can you best help elderly uh, populations, for instance, uh, you know, for cognitive uh, acuity, uh, for simple daily tasks. And in some instances, people relate better to a robot if, in fact, it is anthropomorphic. So, um, so, and then the question becomes, well, how do you gender it? And I actually think it would be nice if we had maybe interchangeable parts so that when you <clears throat> ordered a robot, uh, you could choose the hairstyle, you could choose the plastic color, <clears throat> you could choose, obviously you can choose the name, you know, all these, that seems to me a way that we could let the robots be effective for users, but still um, allow them to create something that they want to interact with from all the varieties of things we have in society. So yes, people are thinking very hard. What we don't want to do, what happened is that all those voice assistants like Siri, can't, nobody thought about it. They just all had female voices. And we don't want this to happen to the robots, right? So um, so there are these fascinating um, groups of people called uh, robot, well, it's their... Um, human computer interaction, their human robot interaction. It's, it's a whole specialty. And I just find their research so interesting. Thank you very much. What we don't want is people doing things by default. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that I was curious. So to use us as a, as, as a, a tool, I guess, you yeah. know, to, to actually put the problem out there so that they, the, the robot, their nurses are actually men. You know? Yes. Then we can, oh, there are only 10% men in the nursing population. Let's open the door to men. Yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Other questions? No, I am... Um, Hello, it's me again. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to ask you like a, a provocation because I was just thinking about um, in my education, from my experience, I always learned from someone or something that was completely different from me. So actually something that is different, something that is uh, that its background, its story, its gender, its complete its, um, sex is different from me is actually a, a, a richness, right? Enriched me. So this idea to, uh, to learn from someone that is like me, uh, can it be a, a, an impediment to learn? Would, is it just a provocation? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's interesting. Um, well, I think in the instance of an elderly person who is maybe senile, uh, having, you know, first stage Alzheimer's that's progressing, I think you want them to be as comfortable as possible. Whereas young people at universities, yes, <laughs> they should be challenged by all sorts of ideas. Um, and I think, I mean, that's the beauty of the thing. Education is to expand our horizons. So I, I think you have to, the first question is, what is this technology for, right? And um, then you can see. So I think for Siri, uh, now you can choose your voice and it would be really interesting to see what voices people choose. So for English, you can choose Australian accent, UK accent, US accent, uh, English, so uh, South Asian English accent. And you can get 
male, female, and I don't know if they have any kind of non-binary. So you could do a really interesting study to see what did people choose and how does that match with who they are? Do they want some? This is what these uh, human computer interaction people study, these sorts of things. You know, do they want someone like them or do they want something different? So um, for Siri, I don't use Siri very much. Um, I, I find she's kind of dumb. But um, but I chose American, I think, female. My husband chose, I think, female Australian because he wanted something just a little bit exotic, you know. So, um, so anyway, it, it, it's something we could study and know. So I have a question back for you all. So what are the Italian funding agencies doing on this front? I have studied a lot of the places in Europe and I haven't heard in many of them are putting into place uh, requirements for the proposals that researchers look at sex, gender and intersectional or diversity is new, right? But should be there. Um, so I know what the Germans, the Germans did this a couple of years ago. They had a two year consultation period where they consulted me and many, many uh, people to see how they should make these requirements. What is Italy doing? Uh, I keep a list of all the, um, to the extent that I can, of all the agencies that have um, guidelines and I don't have anything for Italy. So have I missed something or are you still working on it? Okay, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I am the scientific attaché, Antonella we will be in contact uh, via email, and uh, we are very proud and honored of your talk because you opened a new uh, prospect uh, to see also science <clears throat> in terms of gender. Uh, I am a physicist, so I am accustomed to understand that science um, needs uh, no prejudice on the things because uh, sometimes uh, I use an example uh, when you see an iceberg uh, what is an iceberg you can ask to a bear you can ask to a bird you can ask to a fish and they will uh, talk about an iceberg in a very different way because for a bear will be a platform where to, to rest. For a bird, it will be a big mountain over the sea. For a fish, it is a big piece of ice under the sea. And for a, for a, a human being, we know that iceberg has just a little pieces outside the sea because the most is under, under the sea. So the, the same revolution from the Ptolemaic system to the Copernican system was due to previous prejudice. So now it's a question also to open to gender. And thank you very much for your talk. Yeah, I know for physics. So I don't know if you know Thomas Braga at Lund University. He's a physicist and has for years been trying to see if there are gender biases beyond participation. So in physics itself. And I don't think they have found a good example. They have brought forward a couple examples that I reject. <laughs> but, but Thomas and I are really great friends. Um, but then if you go to medicine, it's really, really important, right? It's not just a, an iceberg kind of thing. It's that drugs work very differently. Women, females and males metabolize drugs very differently. And you're going to cause death if you don't look at these things. And automobile accidents, uh, all these sorts of things. So we don't wanna ask for gender in fields like physics. My son is a mathematician. We don't look for it there. Um, you know, we look for it in places in almost everything having to do with biology. Now, everything having to do with like marine organisms, it's very important, um, you know, and, and then in these products that we make that form, technologies form society as much as they are formed by society. So we want to make sure those technologies are improving society and not just hardening, you know, stereotypes, which have been around for centuries. <laughs> so 
anyway, um, I, I, if, if the Italian funding agencies do establish policies, please let me know so that I can add them to my list of, you know, great things that are happening. Yes, sure. Thank you very much. I promise you guys to hold on to your questions for uh, uh, and see you next okay. time. Thank you. Okay, bye bye. And so, if you would like to ask uh, some questions to to her about her talk, please feel free to do that. I know that it's late. I know that everyone wants to eat. We can talk over lunch. No, we don't have to stay over lunch. Is it okay we we talk over lunch or no? I think. Yeah, I she was ready. Just, just, yes. Just not to mention that there is, since you love you love clouds, there is a beautiful book by Paolo Giordano, which is an Italian writer, well known for the La Solitudine dei Numeri Primi. Ah yes, ah, yes. yes. So from, you know, but then he wrote another beautiful book, which is Tasmania, uh -huh. and he talked about this crazy scientist looking for clouds. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I was very fascinated by your presentation. And I, I have a question, but these modeling, mm -hmm. do they work? Well, yeah, in yeah. the sense that, because I know that the weather is unpredictable, also a crowd of people is unpredictable. So do they, how do you cope with this, the unpredictability of uh, yeah. these elements? So, they do. Uh, they do. <laughs> The clouds, well, they're different, right? On the one hand, we're talking about inner matter, right? Uh, molecules that behave certain kind of physical rules. On the other hand, we're talking about people that have, you know, and in fact, the, the modeling of, of, of behavior, of, it's like, it's a, a different kind of science, if you want. It's called science of active particles. Right, as opposed to molecules that we kind of understand how they work. So, people is like a relatively new in a field of study, like that are looks of people, like it's started in the 50s, so it's relatively, it's relatively new. I think that gas dynamics, uh, we're talking about 1700, right? Uh, when it started with Bernoulli and then Boltzmann in the 1800 and so on, so 50 years kind of, as opposed to three centuries or, or something. Uh, what is the problem with when it comes to clouds? That there is a lot that we need to understand to be able to have a model that is accurate. Like, you can formulate a model, and then it doesn't really work, right? So, and even for clouds, the microphysics of cloud goes back to the 60s. So these are all recent and very active fields where people are still contributing to so that the models become accurate. Absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, what about you? Don't want to go for lunch? I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you again for your beautiful talk. Very interesting. Um, you said that you have children. Yes. So, uh, what is the suggestion to uh, the parents? To improve the STEM passion in children. So, okay. It's different. It's different. I have a four year old and a one year old. So, you know, I've yet to see if they're interested in science. But for me, it's just a matter of like with everything else, I can do with music, like right? exposing. And exposing in a way that is not gender, right? I would not. You know, because I'm a woman in mathematics, I would not apply any prejudice to my daughter over my son. So, like, why don't you just go play with your dolls and like let friends, let yeah, and let him do the science, right? So, I think it's absolutely important that you know whatever you do to your son, you do to your daughter, or to your gender neutral kids. You mm -hmm. know, uh, so for me, it's just really exposure and like try to be light. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you.
Thank you to our distinguished speakers and to the Council General and to Dr. Nitikite and for this really great, stimulating, and thought-provoking conference. Thank you. Okay.